Well, hello and welcome back, everybody, to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John. I sit down every week and I answer each one of your questions. And this week, it's episode 196. Uh, uh, We're looking forward to episode 200 coming up soon. Uh, As always, if you have questions, send them to podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. Uh, It's a... It's an honor uh, answering these questions for you. And this week we have a nice little collection of questions. Uh, A couple of them almost seem to say the exact same thing. So uh, I'll do my best to cover the basics each time. But sometimes when the questions repeat so closely, when we break down the the, the questions into their own little uh, sets, I, I need to make sure I cover all that other information so sometimes it does sound like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. Sure seems that way to me. And let's begin now with our good friend, Casper. Uh, Casper's question's a, a good one um, because he he tried something and had success and wants to share it with us. Casper says, Casper says, so inspired by a podcast by Dan where he talked about the fear of the obvious. It's one of my favorite phrases, fear of the obvious. I decided to give easy strength a go, and only two weeks in, the results have been mind-blowing. Added 15 kilos, 33 pounds, to the deadlift from 105 to 120 times two reps, which is very impressive, and gone from five to 10 reps, from five to 10 reps on the pull-up. I've always struggled to complete a program, but I decided to try easy strength for six months, so basically about three full rounds, which is pretty good, and see how it goes. I do have two questions though. First of all, I'm 29 years old, weigh 73 uh, 73 kilos, and I'm 177 centimeters tall. I'm in school and spend roughly 40 hours a week studying to become a nurse and 20 hours working so my schedule is somewhat tight. At the same time, though I'm preparing for the military, so nursing school, school, and preparing for the military. So you are very busy and will need to find some way to train long distance walking with a rucksack. The goal is 30K with 30K of gear in five hours. Solid effort. In addition to that, I need to get better at running. I can run 2,600 meters in 12 minutes. Okay. Um, and we'll need to get it to 3,000 meters in 12 minutes. For the running, I'm using the Maffey Tone approach for 15 minutes after the easy strength workout. So my question is this, how would you program the heavy rucksack training into the program? And easy strength doesn't include any direct squat work besides the warm up. So by only using easy strength for six months, I'm worried that it will undervelop an important human movement pattern. One of the things you do notice, and I, so I've spent a lot of time around, uh, you know, the military. One of the first things you start to pick up uh, is that, especially in the elite corps, uh, there. And it's interesting. One of Pavel's books, he talks about this. How he, one of the guys, one of the uh, special forces guys, was getting made fun of because of he had chicken legs. Uh, it's an American term. I don't know if any other country uses it. And of course, the guy was, you know, had been mountaineering and doing all this, you know, high end stuff for you know, a, a long deployment. And uh, he and Pavel later had a conversation about how, yeah, I got chicken legs now, but the mission called for me to do this, you know, not to, you know, do do high rep squats. So one of the things I, I'm never concerned with anybody who's getting ready for the military is the lack of squats. Now, the movement of squats, I think, is still valuable. Uh, If you're in the field for a long time, squatting is going to be probably how you use the toilet. Uh, Squatting is also going to be in a position you're going to find yourself in a lot, Uh, not just in defensive postures, but it's just a position uh, you use a lot. Um, You just have to be able to handle your weight, Casper, so I'm not too worried about it. If, If it does come up, I want to hear about it. And I, I want I want to know about it. Uh, you know, I come from a family of military. Uh, my dad talks about how they prepared for World War II. Uh, my brothers will tell you about how they prepared for Vietnam. 
Uh, Phil, um, my late brother Phil, had some funny stories about his his uh, deployments. And very rarely did any of those deployments look like a, a like a movie or a TV show. Uh, the reality of the military is much different. You'll notice the emphasis on rucking, and this comes now. So, first, let me just say yes. There's great value in the movement of squatting. Uh, I think if you keep it in the warm-ups, Casper, you'll be happy you did that. Uh, if you feel the need to add more, um, I don't even have an issue with you one or two days a week, you know, doing a squat workout. Uh, just remember, you can only chase so many rabbits at once. You can only do so many things at once. You're going to school full time. Uh, you're, you're you're preparing um, uh, to be a nurse. You've got... Um, you know, you're preparing for the military. You can only prepare for so many things. But if you do easy strength and you get your Maffy Tone runs in, I think you're in a great place. There's two ways I think you should do the rucking day. Uh, I think I think the second variation is better. The first is you can do it. We do. We set aside a day a week uh, where we have a very quick weight workout and then our long ruck. So if you're gonna do those days like the one set of 10 days, uh, those tonic days, uh, I think that's the perfect day to get your rucking in. So for example, every uh, say like you're doing those light days once every two weeks, um, I really think that those would be the best days for you to get your rucking in. Um, the other idea is to put aside a day a week to ruck. Now, my thought is when I'm looking at your schedule is, do you have any more days of the week to utilize? But if you could do something like a long, um, so you you do easy strength Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, okay? I would love it if you had a nice, uh, easy, easy day on like Thursday, a day to turn the engines off. I, I think that'd be great. Sunday might be a great day for you to do it too. Um, I don't know how you're going to fit in with your busy schedule. Um, but if you can, either do the short tonic day. And by the way, you could also just take a two sets of five day and go lighter. Get the lifts in. Do your pre you, You've made great progress. So, you know, do two sets of three, four, or five in the pull-up. You know, stuff that's very easy. You feel good. Slap the ruck and go. Or have that long ruck day one other day of the week. I'm saying Saturday because tradition in America, most people have Saturday and Sunday off. But, you know, rolling out of bed early on Saturday morning, you know, setting up, I think you said it's a 15K ruck, isn't it? Uh, whatever the ruck is, I, it does, you know, somewhat, oh, it says 30K of ruck. Ooh, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty serious. But I would train up to that, you know, have days you do 10, 10 kilos, have days you do 20, have days you do, you know, occasionally, only occasionally do the test weight of the 30K and just go. Um, here locally, there's a number of people who do rucks on Saturdays. Um, because I coach on weekends, I, I don't get a chance. But one of my goals for this summer is that they do a uh, they do a marathon, uh, twenty six point two mile uh, ruck, and it's just a, it's flat. Uh, the one thing about the, where I live, flat is very unusual. But they have there is a a flat course that kind of cuts through the valley. That's pretty good for those who are local. It's the Jordan River uh, Parkway, um, and they just they just they have a they have a they have a start and they go. Um, the one thing uh, they always say there's really it's really interesting what they find that goes badly. Uh, it might be worth you doing a extremely long ruck, you know, maybe every two months where you go and and maybe what's in your what's in your bag is food or water. I mean, you know, just to get through it and just to figure out what goes. Uh, the straps here really become an issue for a lot of people. Some people complain about the straps up in this area too. But what I want you, oh, and feet. But what you'll notice, it's straps, shoes, clothing, sunburn. It's all the other things that you usually don't consider when you're rucking that seem to show up as the problem. That, by the way, I find 
uh, fascinating just to have that discussion. Uh, it's something you we pick up in almost every uh, kind of sport. Um, very often when, when you coach like American football, you <laughs> you get really good at a lot of things. But when it's time for the game to happen, that's when you realize those gaps of the 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 situation you didn't practice. The oh, I, we oh we forgot this. Uh, the upside of a fairly long, lighter ruck, you'll get a chance to see how your skin deals with the shoes, the elements, the sun, the wind, uh, and the clothes. Uh, and it sounds crazy until it sounds crazy until you have blisters, you know. My father was uh, World War II. Uh, he joined the service before uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, stayed after. And he was very, I mean, the interest he had in blisters, and, and I look back and it's just funny to think about it. My dad, if you mentioned you had a blister in shoes, when I was young, you know, athletic shoes were still much, you had to break them in. I don't know if you still do, but you know, the old leather shoes we I played sports in, you needed some some seat, you had to work with them. But he was just so on about blisters. But then I uh, through through the years I've talked to other World War II vets, and uh, in many parts of especially in the Pacific theater, um, blisters led to infections, and infections were taking many many of our uh, platoons and groups down as, as much as as enemy fire. Um, so it, it was just interesting to hear his take on things. So the nice thing about those longer rucks, you get a chance to see that kind of thing in, in real time for you. I wouldn't suggest those long rucks, let's just say once every two months, the really long ruck. Once every two months, and figure this out logically, your heavy backpack, your 30K backpack uh, for a good distance. The rest of the time, try to just keep you know, nudging yourself up in, in, in what you need to do. There's also a real good chance, uh, that even with no training, uh, with the right circumstances, you might be able to find yourself doing those, doing those tests without an issue. Uh, and this is something we discover over and over. We have this tr perfect training program, but life, uh, and its demands will often make you do something you just didn't think you could do until you did it. Uh, good question, Casper. So stay on the easy strength lifting. I'm not worried too much about the squat, but if you just think you have to, two days a week, get your squats in. I don't think you have to. And on the rucks, I would have a ruck day, at least a shortest ruck day after a, a tonic workout. And then once a week, go for some kind of variable ruck training as I as I discussed. Hope that helps and let me know how you do. Thank you. We have a question from Glenn. Uh, Glenn asks, I am wanting to improve my 5k running time and wondered which exercises I could do in the weight room to help me with this. So really how to train for running and I'm just going to go back. I'm going to turn around and I'm going to turn out the person who changed my career. Uh, Percy Wells Saturday. Um, and I'm just going to share with you what he said. It's going to be easy strength. And the exercises he recommended were, uh, the bench press, the pull up, the cheat curl, which was, uh, interesting, uh, in the 1960s, if you went to a weight room, you would see the, uh, the great, uh, long distance guys doing cheat curls. And you'd look over and there'd be the four time gold medals in the discus, Al Order doing the same exercises. <laughs> bench press, uh, cheat curl is a bit of more like a, a power clean, but with a curl grip. Uh, don't exaggerate either the clean part or the cur cur curl part too much. Try to get a nice blend. That is, so it's not a real throw and catch, jump and catch, nor is it a strict curl. It, and it's kind of, it is literally a cheat curl. Um, he said bench press, pull up the cheat curl, deadlift, something like sit-ups. Uh, today, I'd recommend ab wheels. Or for runners, now I recommend hanging bent knee leg raises. And that's what I'm going to tell you to do. Uh, I would suggest, and, and do it 
and do it the way the the easy summary of easy straight and, and it's it's two three five so it's two three or five days a week two three or five exercises two three or five sets two three or five reps i just gave you a lot of wiggle room so uh if you find yourself in a situation where you all you can get in is your pull-ups and your deadlifts, by the way, that's not bad. Two exercises, and you did five sets of five in those, I think you'd you'd improve. If you do all five exercises, the the press, the bench press probably, the pull-up, the cheat curl, the deadlift, and the the ab wheel or the hanging leg raise. Let's just say ab wheel to save me some time. If you did all five of those exercises, then you did them three sets of three, two sets of five. Yeah, you'd be just fine. Uh, uh, if you read Easy Strength, easystrengthomnibook.com, uh, you'll see that I really do uh, push uh, these variations quite a bit. So uh, the one thing I do want you to think about uh, when you think about lifting for runners is when I was at Utah State, uh, our runners took lifting very seriously. And... They did real. We we were a good track and field team. It for running, it's not going to be any kind of peaking. It's not going to be any kind of uh, program where you just you know you, you you do a death march squat workout. It's getting the reps in with appropriate technique, appropriate load, appropriate reps and sets. Don't worry too much. As, as trying to get your 5K time. Don't worry too much about doing it all in the weight room. Get your running in, get your speed work in, get your over distance work in, and then use the weight room as a, a supplement. And it will help you. Uh, and if you combine the workout I gave you, the let's just simplify it all. I want you to lift three days a week. I want you to do two sets of five, a bench press, pull up, cheat curl, deadlift and then the ab wheel if you do that and you take the and you take your running seriously you're going to be just fine don't forget hill sprints because hill sprints might be the, the best way to build up your overall your overall speed okay thank you it's a simple question a good question thank you we got a question from it looks like pateri you often speak about the importance of switching programs after six or eight weeks of training. The reasoning behind this seems to be the fact that progress through workouts will plateau. Now, and it's hard for many people to do anything for eight weeks. Uh, as I'm talking, uh, I've, I've been in conversations with a number of uh, freshmen, collegiate freshmen, who after all these years of taking college prep courses and their mommy and daddy pushing them to go to the university, they come back after their first year and they say, it's not for me. And uh, it's something in many cases, I'm thinking of the one, the one young lady I'm working with, mom and dad have been talking about her going away to this specific college, you know, probably since she was in preschool. So, you know, you're looking at a 16 15, 16 year commitment to doing something, and you do it for nine months, and you're like, nah, it's not for me. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's, uh, that's kind of the reason I, I, I'm kind of funny about, yeah, every six to eight weeks, I, I understand it. Uh, it's hard to keep those attention spans, uh, I guess. Um, do you have any insight on why this occurs exactly? I mean, if you squat three by 10 and after six weeks, you move to squatting 10 by three, you still squat in both of these programs. What is the thing that boosts your system to, oh, uh, to make new gains after you switch training uh, parameters? How much better off are you after six weeks of three, time, three by 10 and six weeks of 10 by three than if you just squatted three by 10 for 12 weeks? Well, you know, the physical laws, I mean, and I'm not talking about Coach Newton here, who's Coach Isaac Newton, who is really the pillar of everything I do. Um, but there are rules, uh, that, that they're sometimes called the rules of adaption or accommodation, is that 
we're, we're the, the the system, and this could be true for your dog, your cat, and your your pet bird. The system is is the environment is challenging you, and you have to adapt uh, to deal with it. So if you decided to live, you know, in the Arctic for a year, um, you know, nature is going to demand you or that you adapt and accommodate. Now, if if you're going to live in the Arctic for a year, it's going to be a radically different thing than if you're going to live in a, a river valley for a year or uh, parts of, there are some parts of Vermont that I, I think you could easily live, survive for a year with the, with just, I mean, the fish and the, what nature provides for you, but you would still have to make adaptions. Uh, it's, that is just the way <laughs> the wind blows, literally. Uh, why, why it seems to work so well, um, th these, these changes, is that we know as coaches that if we go in with a plan to change before things get stale, and when I say stale, I don't just think mentally stale. I think physically stale is that we have these little changes, these little tweaks, these little adaptions. The body, the body seems to take on the new workout, make a few changes. You look better, you feel better, you move better, but very often you just think better. And, and I think, I think, and I think that might be the most important thing is that uh, we humans need you know, we need a little bit of, uh, we need a little bit of change. Uh, if you live in an area that's got the four seasons and you do something for every one of the four seasons. Um, when I was young, I played American football in the fall, wrestle in the winter, discus and hurdles in the spring. And then I played keeper uh, in, a, in a soccer league and also played church basketball. And Honestly, there was never a need to kind of get in shape for anything because as you move from one sport to the other, my conditioning, I needed different qualities, but my conditioning held up. Um, and yet, though, when I was, you know, kind of running up and down on a basketball court, that was getting me in shape. The cuts and the, the, the all this stuff, you know, all the movement and stuff was getting me ready for American football. And in American football... You know, it's not a lot of conditioning, but it is pretty hard nosed, which prepared me for wrestling. I got to be honest with you. Once I got into wrestling, I didn't need any conditioning work for the the hurdles. Um, we, I think the hurdles I ran were the the 120 yard highs, and you really didn't need to be in shape for it. It was just you know, it was only 120 yards uh, with these 10 things in your way. Um, didn't have to work very hard at all to stay, to, to do the race after wrestling. And that little bit of hurdling seemed to help me in the, uh, being a goalkeeper and playing the church basketball league. It was just, you just kept spiraling it around. So I, 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 you know, I, I just think that that's the way we work as humans. Uh, that the, the winter, spring, summer, and fall, uh, to quote James Taylor, all you got to do is call. Uh, I think that is just the way we're, a lot of us are kind of designed up here. That's the way the world works and that's the way we work. You know, it's not a great answer. And there are people who believe that you could be put on a perfect program and just stick with it forever. Um, you know, I remember reading the stuff from Arthur Jones and uh, Ellington Darden basically said the same thing. And they're, and their, their adaption was always do less. And you, you get to the point where, you know, where they were talking about one workout every eight days. Um, now, I, I've never seen that work personally, but because I'm, I'm a believer that the body needs more, um, more taps of adaption to make things work. I feel like I was all over the place in that question, but, uh, it's, it's works. It's always worked for me. Um, I have certain programs I love and I plug them in certain times of the year when I know it's a good time of me 
like for example, in the fall is a better time for me to do three sets at eight with a minute rest. Uh, the winter is a better time for me to go heavy. So that's just what I found in my life. Uh, your mileage may vary, but it's, it's just the way I think the world and humans work. All right, Pierre, we got a question. You mentioned in passing on a recent podcast, something along the lines, I'm paraphrasing, uh, choose how you want to look, then choose two to three exercises that will get you there and do them for the next 10 years. <laughs> then you moved on to something else, but it's been dancing in my head ever since. Can you elaborate and give us uh, examples? What would be the, mo what would be the most popular pairings uh, impact the way one would look, would look giving diet is in check. Well, that's interesting. Um, well, I, it's, it's strange because we kind of had this conversation uh, over there in uh, Iowa. Uh, so there's certain exercises, like in the kettle, let's, we'll start with kettlebells because this is where the conversation started. But um, most people want to look good. And one of the best ways I know is double kettlebell presses. Uh, military presses and double kettlebell front squats so that's where the conversation started you know it was one of those things you know if all you could do was with these exercises what would they be well from there of course uh you know as always you know it just kind of went down a path uh you know i, I think when you're talking about uh for me uh the conversation then moved to what i thought when i was 14 years old is that if all you had it was a barbell doing the barbell clean and press the barbell squat snatch, which is what I thought were the two perfect exercises when I was 14 and adding the suitcase carry. You know, you could probably do that and make some nice progress. You would look good. I guarantee you would move well uh, for a long time. Some of the other little combinations. Um, now, if you, uh, this can be coming back up in just a minute. Um, but, you know, if you read the Easy Strength Omni book, I talk about handstand push-ups and high rep back squats as as the perfect mass building program. Uh, I mean, whether it is or not, that comes from a discussion from even before that, where uh, if if they don't bother you, uh, dips, chin-ups, so not pull-ups, but chin-ups, and barbell squats, those to me are probably the three best, from my experience and from what I've seen, the three best bodybuilding exercises that you can possibly do. Um, of course, getting someone to come in the gym three days a week and do you know heavy dips, heavy chin-ups, and heavy high rep squats, I know it would work, but after, and you know, it goes back to the earlier question about yeah, I know it would work, but I think after six weeks, you'd, you know, you'd, you'd probably try to, you know, kill me or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think you can, you can pick certain big exercises and, and get a lot out of them. Uh, as you know, I told Pavel that if instead of the side press, if the book Power to the People had been bench press and deadlift, no one would ever write another book in our field again because that's those two exercises, strangely, can do miracles. So if you went into the gym, you know, three to five days a week and did, and you know, obviously you have to be, you'd have to have variations, but um, a bench press variation, you can include anything, any equipment you want or any like inclines or declines or whatever. You did that three to five days a week, two to five, two to five sets of two to five, and then a deadlift variation, two to five sets of two to five. I, I mean, I don't, I don't ever worry about, you know, proportions because I, the body's smarter than that, but you would have some, you would look good and probably feel pretty good. Are there gaps? Now there's the, that's the only thing, Pierre, I want you to make sure, um, uh, on this Pierre, um, there's going to be gaps, obviously, in your training, but are gaps a bad thing? You know, the nice thing we, one of the things we talk about in elite performances, you know, is that's what the off season is all about, is that's filling in your gaps. So, you know, if you took nine months a year and you, 
you know, you got your bench press up to some huge number, you know, without all the stuff, just, you know, good old fashioned straight bench. And you got your deadlifts up to some huge number for reps. And uh, you would have changes. And then after you do that, you just stop and say, well, here's some areas I need to work on and spend three months doing it. I mean, it'd be a fun little experiment. Uh, I like the idea. Uh, I want to say that one of the things someone said this weekend was military press, trap bar deadlift. And I want to say farmer's walk was the third one. And I think it had something to do with the, uh, the army test. But uh, I, I thought when I heard that, it was like, man, that, that's another good one. So these little fun ideas of just picking three exercises and doing them. It's a great idea, by the way, and it's a great thought experiment. For the record, remember this. Sometimes it's good to have a thought experiment. Okay, what if I did this? Or what if I did that? I didn't say this was your gonna how you're gonna train, but the conversation sometimes cleans things up long term. So if we're gonna have this conversation about we're gonna lift five days a week, what are the exercises that you can do each and every day? Well, even if we never do that particular program, the thinking sets us up long-term for some other discussions that might help an elite athlete later on, someone coming off an injury, or just maybe just putting together a, a gym franchise that'll make you millions of dollars. Good question, Pierre, and thank you. We have a question uh, from Alex. What would you tell a person to convince them to try kettlebells? It will probably depend, but let's say somebody who trained with barbell and dumbbells for a few years or somebody new to strength training. Um, so, you know, Alex, this is one of those questions where, uh, uh, yeah, I've had parents ask me to talk their child into playing a sport. I'm always like, oh, I don't want to do that. Um, but so the value of kettlebells, and I always go back to the early renaissance of kettlebells, which would have been around 2001 to about 2008, nine, uh, when a whole bunch of people started doing kettlebells and kettlebells only. One of the things I liked about what I, when I would go to these early uh, certifications, workshops, I went to a convention, is to sit down with these people and the enthusiasm, and it, it was usually something along these lines. They would say, I have I only use one kettlebell. By the way, a lot of the early kettlebell people, uh, a lot of the gentlemen only had a 24, and that's all they did, and they did everything with it. But there was an enthusiasm for a one piece of equipment that you could do ballistic work with, uh, the snatch, the snatches, the cleans, the swings. You could do grinds, the press family, the squat family, the Turkish get-up family. You could also do loaded carries, the waiter walk, the, the rack walk, the suitcase carry. And I'm just talking about the single bell right now. You do half kneeling presses on both with both hands on one knee, you know, the whole thing. And what I liked best about the kettlebell was it was a tool that was a one-stop shop. Now, listen, I know the same could be said about barbells. I know that. But there is something magical about having something that I could easily slide. It's funny because I was looking to see if I had a kettlebell in here because many of the rooms in my house, my home have kettlebells in them. You know, I've got this thing that's this big. Uh, when I drive across country to go to Vermont or to go to sometimes when I drive to workshops, I'll stick a kettlebell in the back seat, I'll, st I'll strap the seat belt through it, and I've got my whole, all my training equipment for the next, uh, this last trip was what, three months? I did that ro three month road trip. For three months, I had one piece of equipment it is true I did bring uh, Brett Contreras glute loop. That is true. Uh, but really, I could have done practically everything with just that single kettlebell. Um, I do think there is something magical about the kettlebell ballistics. Um, that weird kind of tired you get. Now, I know a lot of the writers who praised... Uh, <laughs> I always feel like... Uh, Mark Antony, when I say that, I come not to bury kettlebells. I come here to praise them. Uh, I come not, <laughs> um, a lot of people who praise kettlebell snatches so much said, oh no, everything I said was wrong. This, the, the research I did was wrong. And I'm always like, 
How can the research you did be wrong? I mean, you could interpret it a certain way, but there's something amazing about the kettlebell snatch that just, um, you know, doing that five minute kettlebell test that we have at the certs, you know, watching people breathe and sweat that hard in five minutes. I mean, if you decided to have an hour workout with kettlebells and you finished every workout with the snatch test, I don't know if it's repeatable or doable, but some magical things would happen to you. So that's why I like it. I think the Turkish getup done appropriately with the kettlebell is one of the great, uh, not only just all over body exercises, but all over physical awareness exercises. I still think it's one of the best self-assessments you can do. Um, if you go to do a Turkish getup one morning, and you get up and you all of a sudden you feel something biting or barking at you, 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 it, that you haven't felt before. It gives you a nice little early warning system that maybe you need to, you know, find a better bed, a better pillow, you know, get a new car. I don't know, something. I mean, maybe there's something simple in your life you need to address because out of nowhere you got sore doing something. So that's why I like that. The ballistics, the swing, the snatch, and the clean, uh, I think they do marvels for your heart and lungs. Uh, I like the way, I like the way my heart works when I'm doing the kettlebell snatches. When I work, when I'm prepping up for a cert, and I'm doing. There's that one workout I I talk about where we do three, one, three rounds of 100 snatches in the workout. And that's it for the whole day, by the way. It's a hard workout, and you know after I've done those 300, and it's weird because you. I don't get ravenous. I'm not like super hungry, but man, I know I've done something and it's taken me probably what, 12 to 15, 15 minutes max, but sometimes less than 12 minutes. And I am, you know, I'm, I'm tired. Oh, just for the record, you do, you do the five minute test. You rest as long as you need to You do the five minute test, rest as long as you need to, then you repeat it. And usually we don't use the, the test bell. We go much lighter. So those are the things I talk about. Uh, it's a one-stop shop. Um, you can do the entire human body with one piece of equipment. Uh, if you're on a road trip, you can take it anywhere. Um, it, it also ties into a thought I usually don't talk about, but I don't know, like my 28 kilo kettlebell, people respect, they just respect it when they look at it. Guys will come over and go, and they'll pick it up and go, oh, that's, it's heavier than I thought it was. Oh, yeah, it's, you know, it's nearly, it's right around, what, 70 pounds or whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good load. And, uh, I, and I think there's value to that, okay? Thank you. That was a fun question. I hope I did an okay answer to it. And um, I got 62 pounds, I guess. Sorry, my brain was bugging me. But those are the things I talk about. Um, obviously, maybe other people have other ideas. Um, and I know some people don't like kettlebells at all, but that's okay. I mean, I don't like, there's a whole bunch of shows on TV I don't like, and people seem to like them a lot. So that's the way the world goes. Thank you. Good question. Um, we have a question from Travis. Uh, I want to try the two lift mass builder from the Omni book. During the festive season, of course, I, I like that. For the dips, I have a set of rings, a weighted belt, and I've been greasing the groove daily. All good so far. Why well, you're doing a you're gonna do your dips on on rings? Oh, okay, that's for the squats. I have a barbell and I have the technique down. However, I don't have a rack in my garage, so I can't do the high rep back squats. How would you apply the squat seam from mass made simple to front squat? Whew. Okay. Would you reduce weight levels by some percentage, break up the reps or both? Is this advisable? Alternatively, should I consider the double kettlebell front squat? Uh, and then he says, love the Omni book, money well spent. Good to hear. So, okay. <laughs> in Mass Made Simple, uh, in Mass Made Simple, I have this convoluted, it's a very good program. You do complexes, you do uh, one arm bench, you do bird dog, pardon me, one arm press, bird dog, bench press, high rep squats. It's a hard workout. It is a hard workout. 
So in the Easy Strength Omni book, I reference it and then I came up with this, this idea. And it's, it's a longer conversation because I was trying to discuss why squats are such an issue. Um, and I kind of come around to the idea that if you do either handstand push-ups or dips or chins, um, so handstand push-ups seem to really build mass for a lot of the men I know. They don't work for me. Uh, dips, if they don't hurt your sternum, are really a great mass builder. Uh, back in the 60s, they were considered the ultimate up upper body exercise by many people. And then I'm a big fan of chin-ups. And then for the, the rest, high rep back squats. Uh, if, if I were you and I had to make a choice between barbell front squats and double kettlebell front squats, in this example, uh, I think in this example, I would pick the double kettlebell front squats. And the reason is so much of what impacts the, um, there's two things that make, I think, back squats work hard, uh, work for hypertrophy work. First off is that you barely use your hands at all. You really do. I mean, you, it's a real good idea on high rep back squats not to death grip the bar. You've got enough issues. You don't need to worry about that. You, can, you really can't hold it just like this. With the, with the barbell front squat, grip is going to be an issue. Your fingers popping out is going to be an issue. I guarantee it. I've tried it. That's what happens. With the double kettlebell front squats, grip is less of an issue. But there's another fun issue that's going to happen is that the weights are going to kind of, it, it sounds weird to say it unless you've done it. It'll feel like they're sliding down, and that will make you have to really engage the anaconda muscles to keep them up there. So dips and double kettlebell front squats, um, I mean, you're going to have to go heavy on the dips. You're going to have to push it hard, and you're going to have to try to get those reps of 50 on those double kettlebell front squats. Holding the weight up that long is going to be exhausting. You're going to be fine. You're going to be trying to find ways to find. Um, I don't even know what you're trying to find. Uh, anyone's ever done the, the the set of fifty with body weight on the back squat will know. Is there? You get up and you try to find ways to calm. Like if your spinal erectors are starting to lock up, you try to find ways. To, <laughs> you kind of do this little dance to loosen it up. If you get a if you get a a, a cramp, you try to find ways to not put the weight down, but alleviate the cramp. Uh, you're going to be trying to find ways to survive with the weights right here. It's going to be fun to watch. I think it, I'd like to know how it goes because I think this could be really uh, a winning idea. Dips and double kettlebell front squats. Uh, thanks for reading the book and, and I, I'm going to thank you for doing this, but you might not thank me. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we have, uh, Our final question is from Richard. Uh, Richard says, I'm a 42-year-old male looking for a good at-home hypertrophy bro program with just kettlebells. I've got a pair of 16, 24s, 128, a pair of 32s. And I was, that's almost what I had when I was in, uh, on Bristol Drive. Also have a set of adjustable dumbbells. Listen to your podcast. I noticed you suggest, suggest a lot of overhead presses and squat variations, which I love good because that's what I was going to recommend, but neglect you say I neglect arm chest exercises. Even when I use your workout generator, I notice there's no chest arm exercises. I know these areas were never a priority for you, but I have a hard time ignoring them. I have about an hour and a half a day, six times a week to do my uh, workout with walking included. Do you have any recommendations for a proper full body kettlebell split, which incorporates chest and arms as well, and any exercise you may recommend? or any full body kettlebell hypertrophy programs that you recommend. I'm not looking for a free handout. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm willing to pay for a proper program if it has your recommendation. Well, it's funny you say that because I actually, with kettlebells, I like to think I am the pioneer of the single, the single hand uh, bench press, the one arm bench press. Uh, remember though, keep the off hand free and when I was using that a lot with my athletes 
in lieu of bench pressing. I was trying to break the cult of bench pressing, and I and I think I kind of did a little bit. We took the one the one arm bench press very seriously because it turns that lift into a full body mo movement. Uh, as that weight comes down, as that load comes down, uh, you have to fight it across your X. Your so if it's in my right hand, my left leg has to really light up squeeze hold on my body has to be very rigid and fight and to me that's why the one arm bench press is a perfect hypertrophy exercise so i would say this uh, and i wouldn't i'm going to just give you three days a week because that's what i think most hypertrophy programs should be um it'll be let's go double kettlebell uh uh military press let's do some pull-ups one arm bench press all right and then uh double kettlebell front squats, and then those weird double kettlebell high rep deadlifts, okay? Which I don't like personally, but oh boy, do people get a lot out of them. So um, let's do this three days a week. I want a heavy day. Uh, now you said you got six. You can break it up any way you feel like it, okay? Um, but let's just, let's just stay with three. And if you feel like breaking it up, fine. I think for hypertrophy, more rest is better. But you need to have a heavy day. Traditionally, that is on the easiest day of the week, which is, you know, uh, work and life-wise. So that traditionally was Saturday. And then maybe Monday be your light day, Wednesday be your medium day. And you can feel f free to flip those. On the heavy day, that's the double, you're going to start off the double kettlebell press. Um, I would say, you know, Sets of eight, sets of 10, uh, you know, just go. Uh, I like five sets of 10 for hypertrophy work, and that's what I'm going to recommend here. So on the hard day, five sets of 10, five sets of 12, if you can pull it off. Uh, on the pull-ups, love to see you get a lot of pull-ups in. Don't miss. Um, pull-ups can be a, an outstanding exercise for athletes. And you'll notice that when you look at the early work of Franco Colombo, Arnold, Frank Zane, Reg Park, pull-ups for, for that generation were the answer to so many questions. Okay, the one-arm bench press, the nice thing here is you got one side, one side, one side, one side. Um, we, we were really getting, there's like this one rule, and I think it helps. Let your less strong side start, and that'll dictate the reps. So if on this hand, you get a set of 10, and this is on your stronger hand, you just do a set of 10 you mark, and you try to match it. You can knock out, you can, uh, like, it sounds like three sets of 10. Okay, that's gonna be six total exercises. Is gonna take a long time on uh, one arm bench press. It, it doesn't, it goes really fast. So you can do up to five sets of 10, relatively quickly and you are going to find some interesting changes in your mus muscular development doing that after that catch your breath pop up i'd love to see five sets of 10 in the double kettlebell front squat and then after that i would suggest put the kettlebells in the ground kind of in a very much like a deficit deadlift or a sumo ish deadlift a very hingy deadlift um Love to see you do three sets of 20. Yes, those are high reps. Yes, those seem to be a little bit out of my normal numbers, but that seems to work really well. Now that would be your hard day. On your medium and light day, you've got two options depending on how the bells work. First, you can repeat the heavy day, which is lighter loads, or you can just back off on the number of sets. Both answers are fine. Both answers work well. In my experience, and this sounds strange, we seem to make the best progress on the light and medium days. And I always wonder if that's just the way, you know, if you ever studied uh, Tommy Kono's test tubes, you know, where uh, he would, you, the idea of a workout is you empty the test tube and then you give yourself a time to recover to fill it back up, you empty it. And I've always wondered after a couple of weeks, the heavy, the heavy day kind of empties you out, but those medium days, you're, you're, you're improving your recovery capabilities. 
And I think that's really the secret to getting stronger it, and, and more muscular is having your, is having your recovery so good that you tend to over recover. Um, I, I've seen a lot of different phrases for that. Overreaching is one I thought was really good. But the idea is that on those medium and light days, once you, once you really push those hard days, those medium and light days, when, after you do them, your body rebounds sometimes even better than those really hard, those really hard, you know, to failure, I'm dying here workouts. Uh, many of us who have done things like easy strength or some of the programs I did later in my career that I would get from really good minds. Like I had one Olympic lifting coach tell me I wasn't allowed, a very, very, very famous Olympic lifting coach. He, I wasn't allowed to go over 70% in training for a long time, 70%. That, those are low numbers. And it was weird because I was really starting to itch to go. And the idea was, so at the next meet, I jumped up. And of course, you know, I had some, I had really good meet. And the idea was, okay, now train the new 70%. And I went, oh, I see where this is heading. So I was, you know, I was basically always using lifts that I knew I would get. I had to get because it was so, so light. I, I enjoyed lifting. I didn't get hurt. I had this fresh and energetic approach. And I think that's where progress comes sometimes. You know, if I beat you with a stick every workout pretty soon, you're, you're not going to be too enthusiastic about training. Boy, that was a real mix of fun questions with just, there was some carryover into a few of them, but uh, thank you. Um, uh, these, these were excellent. So thank you all. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, as always, if you have questions, email them to us at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. And um, until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning. And thank you all very much.